with the incredible success of Star Wars, it really became obvious that we were probably going to do another. And George lived in Marin County, and he wanted to relocate ILM uh, up north in San Rafael. And they were asking about a handful of people to come up north and, and set it up again. So on one side, I was gleeful about being asked. On the other side, there was a little bit of a heavy heart, you know, about knowing that there would be people that would be left behind, and they were friends. Went up north, what wasn't there to like about where we were going to do it, you know? It was a beautiful place, close to the ocean, close to the forest. We had the resources and the know-how, and the task seemed so daunting because it was, again, an empty warehouse, and that, like I said, there was a handful of people, and it was our job to figure out where we thought that the room should be and where the stage should be. So we got to be architects, in a way, of the building that we were going to be in a model shop because we could just direct where the carpenters would go. And there was this one little factor, I remember, that they said, um, you know, it'll be a little bit easier because the models are already made, right? And you'll just need to operate them. You'll need to, you know the electronics and all that kind of stuff and how they operate. We'll, we'll use them again, the same models. And I, I kind of bought that, you know. I remember thinking, okay, you know, the models, we'd be able to use the same ones. Well, Joe had already had about a year's worth of drawing, I think, by that time. You know, he was ready to go. And all of a sudden, he starts this and that, and this happens and that happens. And, you know, there's a space slug does this, and then there's an asteroid that does that. And, you know, you realize, oh, boy, you know, it's not just like we're going to get to use the same models over and over again. It's We're going to be making new ones. I mean, could we ever get that done in that period of time? We literally started making and working on models before the walls were built. I mean, some of the walls were built. And then uh, there was going to be a second story in the model shop in half of it. And they started putting in the joists. You know, we'd be working downstairs. And it was so noisy. It was just a bang, bang of maybe 15 different carpenters, you know, working away on the walls, pounding in drywall, that kind of thing. We eventually grew bigger and bigger from the original trilogy through episode one, two, and three, you know. And I was one of the original seven model makers that uh, we eventually grew up and we had 30 and then 40 and then 70, 100 or something like that by the time we did Sith. As far as camaraderie and a family feeling is concerned, there was a real advantage there because a lot of the model makers had been there from the beginning. So we knew each other, you know, brothers and sisters kind of thing. And when you come down to LA, there's a family of people. You know, you can go to the VES awards, you know, and it's like this giant homecoming of people, you know. The same thing with Academy screenings, you know, filling several restaurants with people that you've worked with for those years in special effects and or been model makers and camera people. And it's really a rare kind of uh, fraternity of people. The model shop had some of the same people for 31 years from the first Star Wars. And I can't think of any other model shop that's existed that long. You know, we tried to establish what really were the scales of the different models, but it didn't necessarily mean that the model itself was in scale to each other. There's a really interesting instance where the princess's ship would be monstrously big because it was about five feet long or so to be drawn up inside of a bay of the White Star Destroyer in which the bay is only about four inches long. So you have a princess's ship that's huge being drawn up into the bay that's smaller than the whole ship, you know. We did a number of things like that. The choosing scale is sometimes a tricky thing. You know, you have to know what it is they're going to do with that model. Are they going to explode it? Are they going to get really close to it? Are they only going to see it for far away? Uh, there's an interesting thing that happened with the uh, with Luke's land speeder. Uh, there is, of course, that scene where the sand people are trying to sight it down through their guns, and they needed it far away to go along a curve. Well, the stage is only so deep, and we had a model that was this big. You know, and the camera only can run on a track so long. So it was just easier to make a little six and a half inch one, you know, and have it go uh, in a curve like 15 feet away from the camera. There's a number of times that we've made models bigger or smaller for that reason. On Empire Strikes Back, we knew that George just wanted a much more acrobatic Millennium Falcon. And we knew that the big Millennium Falcon was four foot and it took four people to lift it although it, was, it probably weighed more than 100 pounds, but it was big and ungainly. And trying to make that turn on the pylon without flopping would have been a, a tough one. And so we decided to make one out of uh, the lightest material we could possibly make it out of and half scale. And uh, it certainly, if you look at the old Star Wars and then you look at Empire, 
you can definitely see the Millennium Falcon is just much more active. It, it, uh, it really can fly much more acrobatically. Things like flames and water don't scale very good. They have a size, you know, that they stay, so you just can't do little miniature things. You know, you have to choose your size of your model, and the general rule is the bigger the model, the better for both explosions and fire. An instance of making a very large model would be the conning tower for the big white Star Destroyer. Eventually, those big geodesic domes at the top, uh, one of them had to blow up, so, you know, on the original Star Destroyer, they were only like a quarter of an inch long, you know, big on the three-footer. So eventually we make an eight-footer, but still the geodesic domes are only a little more than two inches. You can't blow up something like that convincingly. So we build the conning tower with about 20-inch uh, diameter geodesic domes, again, using the very brittle epoxy. And we had to make molds off of it and all that kind of stuff. And, and that looks good blowing up you know, a size like that. But you can sometimes make a model that blows up that's bigger and you still have a motion control model that's smaller. So, of course, that conning tower that has the big 22-inch uh, geodesic dome, we built that so that you could take the two-foot Millennium Falcon and attach it to the back side, so it's the appropriate scale. And when you see the big white Star Destroyer from far away and yet you still have to have the Millennium Falcon on the back end, now you have to build a Millennium Falcon that's about as big as a silver dollar to go on the back of that ship. So it just became obvious as shots got designed that we would need to do that. Of course, when they were doing the stop motion walkers, they wanted for that battle scene, there's, there's more than one, two, three walkers. So they had us make some of these little miniature walkers about two and a half inches high or something like that. Charlie did them. And I remember he did one of them too. He cut its leg and he put a little hinge on its leg so it, it could slide its leg back and forth, and so somebody would under, be underneath the table and slide the leg forward just a little tiny bit while Phil and John Berg are up front animating. But they're really cute little walkers about that big. Always when you do explosions or crashes, or anything, the bigger is the better, you know, the scale just looks better if it has a bigger model. And so the big walker, the four-foot walker, in this one take, we're using a high-speed camera, the standard baking soda snow, and it didn't work very good. After its head blew off, the back legs popped out from underneath of it, and it sat down like a puppy dog. It's a silly-looking shot, that's for sure. When we did the inside of the space slug, we carved these like foam ribs, because they had to have light come in from the side. And Joe Johnston came up with a, a great idea. He takes a, a wire brush on a Makita drill, and he has a big vat of hot glue. And what he'd do is he'd stick the wire brush into the hot glue, and then he would just stick it inside the ribs, and, and these spider webs would go all over the inside of the ribs. And it had this kind of a, a vein look, you know. It gave a great scale, too. There's three different wampas, really. In Norway, they had a guy with big extension boots and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's hard enough walking on snow, period, much less walking on snow, the equivalence of stilts. So eventually, it came to ILM to do, and Phil Tippett made a, a head, probably about half-scale wampa, third-scale wampa. And it, again, was a hand puppet, just like the space slug. They used a hot wax to, to make the frozen parts on his hair. Later on, of course, for the special edition, George was always a little bit disappointed that you didn't see more of the wampa. So we made a, another wampa suit, which a guy named Howie Weed got into. We actually made it for Howie Weed, and it was like the standard man in a suit type of thing. It had uh, operating eyes on cables, and the jaw worked, and all that stuff. And, and Howie was in seventh heaven that he got to be the wampa. But we had to make a whole wampa cave, so you got to see him eating a piece of meat. A lot more shots of the Wampa threatening Luke than they really originally had. I got to be the architect of Thieves City, which I thought was really fun. I got to kind of sketch out what different things were going to be. But each individual model maker would just do one building by himself, and then when he finished, I'd tell him a day, a half day earlier, let me know, draw up another one for them, on and on and on. And when it came time to uh, put the vegetation on them and vines and all that kind of stuff, I remember somebody making like lawns on the roof, you know, like a formal garden on the roof, and somebody made like a little lawnmower, and I have no idea if you could actually catch it in the film, you know, but on one of the roofs, 
on one of the buildings in Thede City, there's this little tiny lawnmower. Especially the model environments that we've made, you get a lot of freebies. You know, it is actually a model in the real world. It, it follows all the physical restraints and, uh, and has, of course, all the advantages, too. The swamp on uh, Naboo was that kind of a set. We used 100 Japanese maples with the smallest leaves you could get in the background. A lot of real plant material. Since it was so full, it, it allowed them to almost design the shot after the model was made. You know, fix up the trunks and put a few sculptures in the foreground, and in 20 minutes they're ready to, to shoot it again. Mike Lynch was the model maker that headed up the uh, Mos Espa Arena and the stands and all that kind of stuff. And I remember them analyzing um, pictures of people in stadiums and deciding, well, what percentage of people wear red shirts, what percentage of people wear off-white shirts, you know, all that kind of stuff. So there was a 450,000 Q-tips that were painted with trays that would vibrate and align the Q-tips so that all the heads were down. And, and so he had these fans underneath that would blow subtly and would cause these things to kind of slightly scintillate. Well, it turned out that he had the problem of you had to coordinate the speed of the, the wind blowing the little uh, Q-tips with the camera. And it just became more of a nightmare than you wanted to deal with. So CG basically provided that little scintillating movement or overlay over our Q-tips. And then, of course, they would argue that, well, you know, 60 to 70 percent of the time, they actually did CG people. The model makers have always uh, taken the opportunity to add little personal touches to models. An example of that was with the pod racers, different model makers would head off the drawings of their ship, and so they got to really do, it's like, that's my ship, that's your ship, that's your ship, and all that stuff. I personally got to do Anakin's uh, pod racer, that kind of blue and silver one with the, the big fenders that came up over the front. We all knew that it originally came from a, a Maserati birdcage. It was only like maybe a foot long, and then the engines made it about three feet long. But uh, Mars Guo and people like that, I mean, they had like giant, giant uh, pod racers, at least the engines and things like that. The cockpits were always small, the engines were really big. The intention with those models was kind of under the supervision of John Knoll. They were to go in the, uh, the pod race hangar, be outside in the sand. And at the same time, they'd started that process where they digitized our models and then uh, wrap the paint and aging around it. The arena model could be separated into several sections to allow for more than one camera angle. It was a, a 360 degree model about 15 feet tall and uh, 15 feet in diameter. After the crew of sculptors finished for the day on Geonosis, I would take a small sandblaster and modify the carving so as to have that Geonosian look. It was made similar to an anthill spittle and dirt. It wasn't actually sand I was sandblasting with, it was of course walnut shells, very fine walnut shells. We shot on this model for a couple of months with several camera crews. And of course we were shooting like the inside of a, a tire or a, inside of a donut uh, rather than from the outside like most models would be shot. This model allowed CG to comp in their blue screen and CG elements where they needed. They could then pick whatever angle uh, suited them. A large environmental miniature like this can be very cost effective. In CG, every detail would have to be described and painted. That would take a very large and expensive file. With a model, all those extra angles are free. The Utapau sinkholes were described in the script as being like the cenotes in Mexico, big sunken holes in the earth, limestone probably with water at the bottom. The sinkholes were described as being a mile or two deep, and of course that would have made the, the bottom buildings hot, damp, and extremely dark. We were asked to come up with buildings that had a variety of styles to suggest that the underground civilization had been there for some time. Some buildings were ancient and some were more modern. Uh, it was supposed to be a whole mix as if they'd been there forever. I particularly like the buildings that uh, look like they were made out of the rib cage of a giant animal, or at least took their inspiration from a rib cage. And one of the landing platforms is, of course, this ribcage building. We built the buildings in two scales. The large scale was used for the fight between Ben Kenobi and Grievous. 
the rock walls for that miniature were originally about 18 feet by 30 feet, and we eventually cut it into segments and reconfigured it to our needs. Uh, we needed a roof and side walls, depending on how the shot went. On the small scale Utapau, we used sharpened palette knives to sculpt with. On the larger scale model, we used sharpened machetes. Kind of gives you an idea of uh, the difference in scale. On Mustafar, of course, Mustafar is the, uh, the big lava planet. Well, uh, I was the head uh, sculptor on that particular sequence, actually. And we buy the foam, like you get a block of foam 18 inches by 4 foot by 8 foot, and we just used hundreds of them to cover an area that's uh, 30 feet by 45 feet, something like that, and up about 13, 14 feet. We had to use a lot of it. And it was one of those things that we did the machetes thing with. We had, you know, how many, 10, 10 sculptors at a time maybe crawling over the thing. The actual physical lava that we used for uh, Mustafar was methicil. It's like a food additive, and I think it's used for uh, things like ketchup, you know, make ketchup thick, malts sometimes, that kind of thing, a food thickener. And I remember I was working on the sculpture, and Eric Jensen and uh, Mark Wallace were working on the waterfall and the plastic. They were off to the side, and I was thinking, man, they have problems, you know. I mean, I knew from doing lava before, underlit lava, how many problems it can be because you get a brighter lava where the lava is thinner, you know, and in reality, and like you go to Hawaii, it's almost like where the lava is thickest is the brightest, you know, it just has the most mass to it. So you're trying to do the opposite of what uh, real lava is with this light underneath. And then you have the problem too that the plastic doesn't move with the lava, so anytime you have a joint, you have a problem. If it thins out near the joint, you'll see a dark line. You know, it's like there's just an incredible amount of problems to, to solve in bottom lit lava. But, you know, they worked away at it, worked away at it, and came up with great ideas. You know, they'd, they'd make clear bumps that would cause the lava to flow over a certain area, to go over a, a problem area. You know, they knew that, you know, if the lava thins out over here, were in trouble, so they'd make these little lumps that would cause the lava to, to flow thicker in certain areas. For one thing, the methicil is not cheap. You know, you, you get it in these four foot by four foot by four foot drums, and quite expensive from a company in LA, and they dye it to the color you want it and that kind of thing. So it dictated kind of a circulating system, and so they had to have catch basins that filtered out all the crust, which was kind of a combination of cat litter and some other bonding agent to hold it together and black material that would make it black. So all of that had to be filtered out and then colorant, you know, you didn't want to get too much colorant in it and then it had to be pumped up in these gigantic tubes up to the top to do, so they could have the lava running continuously so they could do, you know, more than one shot or different takes over and over again and not have to say, okay, stop, reload the machine, f make the lava flow. Way up at the top of Mustafar, there had to be crust adders, you know, that they would be, uh, have their buckets there of like, you know, the cat litter and the, the other material and lay it out and somebody would yell out, you know, it's getting too thin. You had bull horns, you know, getting too thin, more crust and thin it out, thin it out, you know, and have like little chopsticks for manipulating the crust on the lava. It was one of the longest shoots with a the model there ever been. I think it was like four months or something like that. It was like... Those guys working inside for 12 hours a day. And on Mustafar, it was so much light to light the lava from underneath that the room, of course, was really hot and steamy. And even though it'd be wintertime, the guys always just had t-shirts and shorts and no socks and, you know, running shoes kind of thing. And they always have extra clothes to put on to go outside.